like to welcome everyone, especially our visitors. Our meeting this evening will be from Isaiah 6, 1 through 8. That's Isaiah 6, 1 through 8. You can find this in the Pew Bible on page 463. This is about Isaiah's vision as he's called to be a prophet. Isaiah 6, 1 through 8, let me read. I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. <laughs> holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. And one of the seraphim flew to me, and had me in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this is touched by this, the inequity is taken away, and the sin first. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. Presence this evening, our first song tonight will be Give Me the Bible, singing the Home Force Bandits, of course, after the second.
Father, as we just saw, we bid you to hear our prayer, understanding the kind of people we were, understanding the kind of things that we've done, understanding, Father, the great sacrifice of your Son that allows us as your people to come to that throne of grace with hearts that are heavy, and we can confess our sins to thee. We're thankful and grateful, Father, for this opportunity. We know that our activities are naked before thee, that there's nothing we can hide. So we bring these hearts contrite, open to rebuke, ready to receive your forgiveness, made possible by thee, the precious blood of thy Son. We thank you, Father, for allowing us to be your children, to have such an honor, to receive such blessings, to have such a great hope. So, Father, be with us this evening as we try as feeble as we might to sing with purpose and honor to your name, to have forgiveness and forbearance in our own hearts towards one another, to be purposeful when seeking to find to do good to our brothers and sisters and those that are outside the body, for the main purpose, Father, that you may be praised and glorified. And that the things that we go through in this life, they will help make us and mold us to be more like your son. We thank you for again for your patience with us through this process. Forgive us when we fight back. Forgive us when we don't look at ourselves. Forgive us when we make excuses. Father, be with us this evening and the speaker and the rest of the things that we'll try to do again in a feeble manner, trying to worship a holy, holy, holy God. It's beyond our perception and our conception. And we pray, Father, that it would be acceptable that in the things that we're doing, we're trying to seek your will. Seek, seek your will clearly and to be purposeful to have that will done in our own lives. So give us those kind of hearts. Help us to have those kind of hearts. Help us to desire to have those kind of hearts. So we can present with these feeble hands to the Lord of all. Our hearts, the Lord, all that we can, Father, that it would bring glory and honor to you. We pray that you accept these things as it is according to thy wills, your will, and bless us for the rest of this service. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.
take our Bibles over to 2 Timothy. Let's take our Bibles over to 2 Timothy tonight, and we'll be able to jump into the lesson. I want to welcome everybody here. I know that it is not always easy to come out on a Sunday night. Thank you for making that effort. Thank you for doing that if it just meant fighting traffic. Thank you for doing that if that meant putting a whole bunch of kids in the car. Thank you for choosing to be here. So tonight is continuing with our theme lessons, looking at Vessels of Honor from 2 Timothy chapter 2. We'll do a little bit of recap and then get into lesson number 5 tonight. We said in lesson number 1 that this was a little bit like those really cool stainless steel uh, water jars, or whatever you call them. <laughs> that that was specifically made, right? Those were specifically made to keep the drink cold, to be very portable, to be very fashionable. That's a vessel with a great purpose, that God has a purpose for all of us to be useful in his family. But we acknowledge that meeting those high purposes wasn't always going to be easy and not something really that we would do on our own. And so at the beginning of chapter 2, Timothy was told to be strong in the grace of God, to, to lean on God's grace in order to be a vessel of honor. And then in lesson number three, we talked about the need to treasure scripture. That if we're really going to be those vessels, then we had to know it and we had to protect it. Or as Paul said, we have to retain it and we have to guard it. This, this um, information that was given to us was like a treasure to be held on to. And then Dave, for us, in lesson number four, covered escaping entanglements. Again, directly from 2 Timothy chapter 2. That no soldier in active service entangles himself. And Dave pointed us towards Jesus' words, the thorny ground that we get entangled in worries and riches and pleasure. So we're off to a good start in becoming and being vessels of honor by God's grace and through these good instructions. And that brings us to tonight's lesson on avoiding ungodly influences. Avoiding ungodly influences. And this becomes really important and really clear when you start to think about the relationship that existed between Paul and Timothy. Remember in 1 Timothy, he calls him my true child in the faith. In 2 Timothy, he talks about him like a son. Because when Paul speaks about avoiding ungodly influences, what he really has in mind is a shipwreck. He just cares about Timothy too much to see his life ruined. It comes across really clearly in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. The whole picture here is that in every shipwreck, there is loss. There's a loss of value for whatever cargo is damaged. There's a loss of the vessel. There's a loss of peace, because that's a traumatic thing to go through. And often there is a loss of life. There are no shipwrecks without loss. And Paul is writing to Timothy, I don't want to see you crashed upon the shore. I just care about you too much. And he specifically calls out Hymenaeus and Alexander, some other people that Timothy probably knew, to say, hey, don't go down that path. <laughs> Isn't that how we all feel? That we know our friends and our family that used to walk with the Lord. But they've been shipwrecked. So Paul says in 2 Timothy, avoid worldly and empty. And just stop there with me for a minute. It says chatter. That's going to be a lesson on speech. We're going to do that next month. But avoid worldly and empty everything, really. But avoid worldly and empty chatter because it leads to further ungodliness. And their talk spreads like gangrene, among whom are Hymenaeus and Philetus. This warning that he starts 2 Timothy with is very similar to how he started 1 Timothy because he just cares about this young man. And what he says, you've got to understand, Timothy, is that it never stays still. It leads to or it spreads. It's like when Jesus told the apostles, watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. What they're doing isn't going to stay just around them and in their life. You get too close to that and you're going to have this boil over into your life as well. And he specifically mentions Hymenaeus again, the same guy he referenced in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Again, suggesting that Timothy knew this guy to say, Timothy, you know what happens when you get too close to these ungodly influences. You know the shipwreck that comes, and I just care about you. I love you, son. Don't do it. 
So there's that heart here. But you might say to yourself, oh, Philip, oh, this is going to be a great lesson for those teenagers. You warn them. This is not a lesson for teenagers. I mean, it's like a lesson for teenagers, but this is not a lesson for just teenagers. Because really the second dynamic of this is that he has to say this to Timothy because Satan is specifically targeting the successful. Satan would love to take out Timothy. Timothy is doing good work there in Ephesus. Timothy is being a great influence. He's living as a vessel of honor. And if Satan could take him out, maybe he can split the church. You know, maybe he can take a whole bunch of people with him. Maybe this can just be a domino effect. And so I want you to think about for a moment that all of us need a lesson on avoiding ungodly influences, whether we're young and we're getting started or whether we've been doing this for a little while. Like Moses. Do the math in your head real quick. What do you remember about Moses, right? Okay, he's 40 when he goes and he leaves Egypt. And then he's a shepherd for another 40 years. And then God calls him and sends him back to Egypt. How old was Moses when he struck the rock? If numbers covers about 38 years, Moses is 118. Everyone here under 118, you need this lesson. How old is David when he sins with Bathsheba? Mid-50s. How old is Timothy when he gets this letter? Early 30s. It's not just a lesson for teenagers. All of us that want to be vessels for honor need to hear this loving call from the apostle. To say, don't get mixed up in these ungodly things. Because the temptation is there. And man, sometimes you just want to do things your own way. Right? And that's ultimately where Moses is. I mean, I know I'm supposed to speak to the rock. But this time I'm going to strike the rock. Right? Sometimes there's just this appeal to say, I'm really sick of doing it that way. Or I'm really sick of submitting to that authority. Or I'm really just, I think that my way is best. And we turn back. And we say, I want to do things my way. When Korah, in the book of Numbers, when Korah leads his rebellion against Moses, there are people lining up to join him, aren't there? Because they're like, that's right, Moses is nothing special. Let's do things our way. And that ungodly influence of Korah has a devastating impact on those people. Or maybe it's just a temptation that appeals to our desire for man's approval. Think about King Saul. In that very first battle there in 1 Samuel chapter 13, in his early 30s, when he was afraid of the people leaving, he says, I forced myself. And he made that offering to try to keep the people's approval. Or maybe it's just our desire for worldly pleasure. Like John writes about the lust of the flesh or the lust of the eyes or the pride of life. My point is really straightforward. If Jesus knew the apostles needed it, and Paul knew Timothy needed it, then so do we. So what I've tried to do is not just go everywhere. There's kind of a lot of ungodly influences. I've tried to zero in what were the specific influences that Timothy was facing in Ephesus and that come out here in verse and second Timothy that we need warnings about. And I want to spend just a couple minutes on a few of those. So number one, We've got to avoid ungodly role models. This is kind of cool as you look at first, excuse me, Second Timothy chapter one. You see it in the inverse in verse five. Paul says to Timothy, "I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am sure that is in you as well." Paul is intentionally beginning this epistle saying, hey, Timothy, you do have outstanding role models in your life, and it's the women in your family. We know that Timothy's father was Greek, so not the best spiritual role model. And you would think that maybe his grandfather might have been mentioned, given that Deuteronomy 6 says you're supposed to teach your son and your son's sons. But it's not the men. It's the women. They are the godly role models. In his life. And he's reminding him, Timothy, you don't want to look at Hymenaeus and Philetus. You don't want to look at these other guys. Your contemporaries, they had started strong, but they turned away from the truth. There's that contrast between these women and his family and the co workers that he would have known is pretty strong. So it just sets up for us 
who are we going to have as our role model? Now, I took a quiz one time when I was hanging out with my little brother, and one of the first questions on the quiz was, like, are you Gen Z or are you a millennial? Write down who your role model is. And it was a trick question because they said, if you're, what is it, if you're Gen Z, you don't even have a role model. Only millennials do that. Well, I don't think that's true. I think all of us have decided that Jesus is our ultimate role model. But isn't it true that it's easy for us to be fascinated by the titans of industry, right? The heroes of athleticism. To look at that group of people and go, what Elon Musk has done for engineering is just incredible. And, and it is. And the money that Jeff Bezos has put in his pocket is phenomenal, right? And the things that these people can do with the basketball, but don't we agree? That the heroes of our culture are almost always poor role models. And so this letter begins to Timothy to say, you choose carefully who you're really looking up to. You choose carefully what path you're going to be in. And you remember those godly women and the path that they have been in to make sure that you follow in their footsteps. That is a warning for every single one of us to consider. But what else would he say? to his son in the faith. That he would say, you've got to avoid these shallow religious leaders. Look over at chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. In verse 5, after he has listed all this group of people that love all the wrong things, he sums up by describing them in verse 5 as holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. He specifically says, avoid such men as these. We have this all around us today. People who will use the name of God and proclaim the name of God, but they are really worshiping the idols of popularity and entertainment. They are truly denying the power of the gospel, and they turn to the power of smoke machines and lighting effects. That's not for us. It's just not. Shallow religious leaders can do so much damage. And we see that all through the history of the Old Testament. When we think about what the people were enticed towards in the Old Testament, time and time again, they had the option between climbing up on a hill, finding a beautiful green tree, and worshiping idols on the quote, they would call them the high places, or actually sacrificing a lamb, bringing it to the priests and the Levites, coming to the temple. And again and again, the people, that, it's not that they never came to the temple, it's just that they found the high places very fun. They found the high places very enjoyable. And they were warned in Deuteronomy 12, don't do it. And yet, they're doing it right through 1 Kings and 2 Kings. And if you've ever read, it just it comes up again and again in the histories and in the prophets. They keep going to high places and you're like, what is so special about the high places? <clears throat> Well, that was where you could worship however you wanted. That was where you could worship to blend in with the Canaanites and to blend in with the rest of the society. When you went to the high places, you didn't have to have all that reverence and all that seriousness and all that sacrifice and all that cost of really coming <laughs> and humbling yourself before the Lord. And it just becomes a heartbreaking, repeated pattern all through the Old Testament. And so Jesus has warned his apostles, watch out for wolves in sheep's clothing. Remember that in Matthew chapter 7? I just want to say that if anything made the cut to make it into the Sermon on the Mount, that's probably a really important topic. <coughs> and if Jesus would say in Matthew 7 to avoid the wolves in sheep's clothing, then how much more do we continue to need to avoid? What did he say in verse 5? They hold to a form of godliness but they have denied its power to avoid such men as these. Now, as we talked about the pain lesson for this year, one of the, one of the brothers of Paul said, you know, part of what we're trying to avoid there is also what I referenced this morning, this happiness-based decision justification. It is shallow religious leaders that will say, do what makes you happy or God just wants you to be happy. Do you realize how often the word suffer comes up in 2 Timothy? Look back at chapter 2 and verse 3 for one example. Chapter 2 and verse 3, literally, suffer hardship with me 
as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Look at chapter 3 and verse 12. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So teenagers, I have to talk to you for just a second. Look, you're going to leave here. You're going to go to college. You're going to go get a trade school, whatever. But you're going to go somewhere. You're going to walk in a church building. And if they're acting like it's always going to be uh, this beautiful, comfortable, easy thing, they're missing this, aren't they? Good soldiers are going to suffer hardship. That's part of the job. That's part of this picture. And so it, it just leaves us shipwrecked if we do not appreciate the endurance that God has truly called us towards. I, I am worried about the you-do-you mentality that is taking over. That, that mentality that says you can have your family look like whatever you want, your friendships to look like whatever you want, your worldview to look like whatever you want. Cora wanted that. And God literally opened the ground and swallowed them up. He put an end to it immediately. <clears throat> we need a true and reverent and biblical mindset. And shallow religious leaders are not going to give us that. Timothy is warned to avoid those kind of people. Pretty similar to this, but not confined to the world of religious leaders, is to avoid those who call evil good and good evil. <clears throat> We know that that's a quote from Isaiah chapter 5, right? Isaiah chapter 5. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. If you're still there in 2 Timothy 3, look at verse 8 and 9. He picks out two people that absolutely encapsulate this mindset. Verse 8. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses... So these men also oppose the truth. Men of depraved minds rejected in regard to the faith. They will not make further progress. Their folly will be obvious to all, just as Janus and Jambres followed what folly was also. You remember that this is a reference to uh, Pharaoh's wise men. That what did Moses do? He came in not just with the message of God, but with the power of God. He could cast his staff down and it turned into a snake, right? He could put his hand in his cloak and pull it back out. And God gave him power. And in the face of obvious miracles, these guys say, well, actually, Pharaoh, you don't really have to listen to this Moses guy. Let me give you this little workaround. So here's how I'm going to call these guys. They are the cultural acrobats. <laughs> You know, they can bend and twist like you wouldn't believe. They are the cultural acrobats. They hold impressive positions or credentials, but they constantly use their ability to persuade others to oppose the truth. That's what Paul is describing in verse 8 and verse 9. And we see that at every turn. We see it in business and in government. We see it in journalism and in academia growing voices that use their positions to call evil good and good evil. We have a responsibility not to allow that kind of leaven to spread into our thinking as the world tries to redefine the very statutes and blessings of God, opposing the faith in Christ. We cannot let those voices rule in our lives. They spread like gangrene. And they lead to a shipwreck. We need to avoid it. The fourth one is a little different. In 2 Timothy, we're told to avoid the myths. Read with me in chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. Chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. And they will turn away their ears from the truth, and they will turn aside to myths. People who want their ears tickled, they like a good story. They like a good myth. Whenever the, the book and then the movie, The Da Vinci Code, came out, you remember that many different evangelists were, were concerned about this and the, the mindset that was behind this. And some people would object and go, well, but it's just a movie. You know, it's just a book. It's just a story. Whoa! Just a story? Stories shape the way we think about our lives. 
Stories of what Jesus used to impart spiritual and heavenly truth in a way that were accessible and memorable in the parables. Stories can be extremely powerful. And stories, stories are big business. Remember, where is Timothy? He's in Ephesus. And if you turn your Bibles to Acts 19, verse 19, you would remember there were a lot of things going on in Ephesus, right? That's where there were magicians. And I don't mean bewitched and wiggling your nose with a little Harry Potter. I mean like demonic people trusting in things that were not of God. There was witchcraft and there was idolatry. And that idolatry had turned very, very profitable in Ephesus in Acts chapter 19. The global, the global um, entertainment industry has a value of about $2 trillion a year, media and entertainment. The U.S., out of that global $2 trillion, makes up $660 billion of that every year. In fact, $660 was how much was made in 2020. There was something going on that year. It was kind of a down year for movie theaters, wasn't it? $660 billion telling stories, entertaining people. And people that want their ears tickled will turn aside from this. Now, I'm not standing here preaching against every form of entertainment. What I'm standing here saying is, how do you decide? How are you choosing that next streaming series or that next podcast? Is it just what's popular? Is it just what people are talking about at work? How are you choosing that next playlist on Spotify or that next app you're going to scroll through? You know, they call it a feed for a reason. They're feeding you this worldview and this information again and again and again. And we have to turn away from those things that are actually ungodly. The top 10 games for Xbox, the majority of them have a 17-year-old plus rating. And we just got Andrew and Xbox. Not against video games in all capacity, but do we have to choose carefully? Can we just pick the top ten? No, those would not be appropriate. How am I going to really choose? I think we have to look at some content, and obviously, those things that glorify and celebrate sin are not for Christians. But I think we already know that. What I'm especially concerned about, what we need to be mindful of is that these stories, these myths that seek to instill a corrupted worldview, that seek to tear down any concept of eternal life, or any concept of walking with humility, or any concept of loving our neighbor, those are things we have a responsibility to avoid. And as parents, we have a responsibility to supervise. We want to instruct our kids. But we want to come behind them and check. I hope every parent here knows the passcode to every device your kid has access to, the password to every app that they use, and that you are frequently monitoring it. Is that because I don't trust these guys? No, I love these guys. It's because it's necessary. It's because Satan is working overtime to bring down 118-year-olds and 50-year-olds and 30-year-olds and teenagers as well. And we must be mindful about this. Why? Look at chapter 4, verse 10. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. Because Satan wants you and wants our teenagers to be the next Demas. Demas. Having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Demas did not fall in love with this present world just because of the suffering that is out there. Demas fell in love with this present world because he bought into the story, he bought into the lie that this world has more to offer than Jesus Christ. Nothing can be further from the truth. It is Jesus who seeks to give us what is best for us. <laughs> what blesses us. So we need to avoid these various ungodly influences and we need to avoid these ungodly stories. But maybe the, the sore thumb, the thing that stands out and doesn't really match the rest of the list is the one that comes on the inside. Because there's this ungodly influence that brings out the very worst 
in us. And I want to tell you, we need to avoid everything that attacks our sobriety. What do you see Paul conclude this letter saying? You, be different from all these others. You, be sober in all things. That is not just a statement about intoxication. That is a statement about his entire outlook and his abilities. You, be sober in all things. Be ready to endure hardship. Do the work of evangelists. Fulfill your ministry. And I wrote it in my notes as a plea. Please, no more calls from wives that find their husband passed out drunk. Please, no more divorces. Because you thought, I drink just a little. And I never get drunk. Until you do. And please, no more lines at the funeral home. Because they ran off the road? Please avoid all attacks on your sobriety. In your grief, and in your sickness, and in your loneliness, and in your spiritual doubts, and in your dating, and your marriage, and your stress, it's not the answer. And marijuana is not the answer. And prescription pain pills are not the answer. Opioids are not the answer. Alcohol is not the answer. These things are not the answer. These are the things that bring out the worst in us. And Paul is speaking to his son that has the potential to be a vessel of honor. He knows that Satan is working to take him away from that mission. He wants him to be sober in all things. And that is exactly what I want for every one of us. He ends the same way I like. The same way I like. You don't have to go down that path. You don't have to give in to those temptations. You can follow the teaching, the conduct, the purpose, the faith, the patience, the love, the perseverance, the persecution, and the sufferings of those that have walked in the footsteps of Christ. Because Paul declares boldly, the Lord has rescued me from all of them. Whatever hardships came, whatever difficulties came from being in this world but not of this world, I was never alone. The Lord stood with me. The Lord rescued me. The Lord was taking care of me. We don't need the ungodliness of this world. We need Jesus Christ. He is the one that makes us vessels of honor in the household of our Father. And so that's the vessel you want to be. You want to put all these things behind you. We are here to help you. We are here to lift you up, no matter which one of these has been a thorn in your side, so that you can have that eternal life that is found only in Jesus Christ. We would love to pray with you privately or publicly in any way. Just make your spiritual needs known as we stand and sing. I am no longer to linger, shine by the world's divine.
this evening. Uh, we appreciate your presence this evening. We've asked you to stay around a little bit after service so we get a chance to meet you and talk with you and see what we can do for you. Uh, also, again, on Wednesday, we'll be continuing the Bible study in this morning, so please be back at those times if you can. Also, on February 25th is the latest day. That's from 9 a.m. to noon. And then on the 26th, there's a special singing for Stephen Rouse. And then we have a gospel meeting, March 5th through 8th, with David Bain. Also, I was told, I don't know if you go in the back, but if you go in the back during services, the resource room is actually a translation room. So there's a sign on there that says, don't go in. So if you could stay out of there during service so the translation can still continue, uh, we appreciate that. Also, let's remember those uh, of our members that have needs. Uh, I, have a new, I do have an update on Tom Cook. He's out of ICU in the, in the new room, and he requests our prayers. So let's continue to remember Tom in our prayers. And also, there's some bulletins in the back if you don't have them. We'd like to have a list of those we should be uh, praying for. Also, Stuart and Jan Shannon, our grandparents, I was supposed to announce this this morning. I had pictures, I enjoyed them all myself, and didn't share them with you. <laughs> uh, Mary Stewart had uh, a boy, Caleb Andrew. I'm not going to say the last name, you know, he messed up, but this has Andrew. Mosher, and I messed it up. <laughs> Arrived on Friday at 3.30, 3, 3 a.m., I'm sure you all up. Uh, seven pounds, 11 ounces, 20 inches. And everybody's doing well, so let's rejoice with them in that. Tonight in service, kids' class will meet, so please take part of that. And also, the middle and high school studies will also take place. And also, group one will meet tonight at church. As part of group one A or B, please help with that. Those are all announcements I have. If you'll please stand. The Lord's Supper has been left prepared. Uh, you'll exit the auditorium and go to the back. Room number 12, you have the opportunity to take this time. Dear Lord, you're all-knowing, and you know what's good for us. Please help us not to um, pay attention to ungodly influences and not to be an ungodly influence. Please forgive us when we give in to this temptation. May it please be with the sick and the families expecting babies, and please be with everyone, uh, please be with all the families that have um, lost a loved one. Please be um, with all those studying your word and let me make a good decision to come to you. And please be with everyone else who needs your help. Thank you for this Lord's Day in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> They didn't work so hard. They got away getting hot. They've been over the mountain. Well, I'm sorry.